In this video, we're going to look at the organizational structure and hierarchy of Revit elements. It's important that all Revit users understand this organizational structure so that they can efficiently create and document a building model. Let's start with the Revit hierarchy. To begin, there are categories, and then you have families, types, and then instances, which are individual elements. So when you place an element, you place a single instance, and that element is of a certain family type, and the type belongs to a family, so a family type or a type, and then as, as it indicates, it belongs to a family, and then those families are organized into a category. So let's take a closer look at these terms and and what it means when you're working in Revit. To begin, categories are that's Revit's main organizational structure for families. And those are high-level groupings of elements and they are intuitive. So in other words, we have things like walls, windows, doors, ducts, pipes, structural framing, structural columns. And so if you actually went to a a construction site and started pointing out individual objects, then you would probably be calling out the category. So these categories, they also determine the available parameters and how the elements behave. And so really the category is telling Revit what this object is, what the element is and how it's going to behave. And then we have families. So once again, everything in Revit is a, it's a family, belongs to a family, and there are three kinds of families. There are system families, loadable families, and in-place families. Let's take a closer look at each one. System families are defined within Revit. So in other words, when you have a Revit project or even a project template, the system family is defined within that file. And so some examples are walls, roofs, floors, ducts, pipes. These are system families. Loadable families are defined in .rfa family files, and these are created and modified in the Revit family editor. So they are external files. They are external from a project or project template. And they are then loaded into a project. And then they can be used in the project. So some examples we have here are windows, doors, columns, beams, air terminals, plumbing fixtures, and lighting fixtures. Now, typically a good way to think about it is that system families are created on a construction site. So if you, if you, going back to the construction site example, if we look at what is being constructed on site, that's where we come up with things like walls, roofs, floors, ducts, and pipes. And so those are typically created on the site. Now, I know that example can break down a little bit as we get into prefab and, and, and duct and piping spools, but that's kind of a, high level rule of thumb there if you want to try to think about it. The loadable families are typically what you would purchase and then they'd be shipped to the construction site and then installed in a certain way. And so windows, doors, plumbing fixtures, lighting fixtures. Now once again that example does break down a little bit because you would think about beams and columns to me, intuitively, using this example, they would fall under the system families, but that's not the case. Columns and beams are loadable families. And so, once again, that's kind of an analogy to kind of help you get going, but it does break down at a certain point. Lastly, we have in-place families, and those are not used very much. And the reason is because those are intended for unique components that need to be created in a project that are specific to that project. So a way to think about this is it's almost like creating a loadable family inside a project. And I say that because when you create an in-place family, you use some of the same tools that are in the family editor. They become available 
in the project for you to create that family within the project. All right, so we have categories, families, and then types or family types. It's another way, just another way to say it. So when you create a family, it can have multiple types. And those types can be created for different sizes or materials or really any other parameter that you want to vary. So if you think about, let's just use an example of a door. And so if you want to have a door that's three feet wide, that can be one type. And then if you want to have a door that's two foot ten, that can be another type. And so you have a door family, so it's the same geometry, can even be the same material, and then you can have two types for those different widths. Uh, if we another example of an air terminal, you can have a a 24 inch by 24 inch air terminal, and then you can have a 12 inch by 12 inch, and so essentially everything's the same except for the size. And so when you switch types, those those sizes change, but it can also be different materials. And so maybe you want to have a, a wood door and then you want to have a metal door or a, a lighting fixture of a, a certain uh, you know a certain finish on it and you want to swap out different finishes those can be different types and so we we could talk about examples all day long with different types and so those are defined by a Revit user and you can get as creative as you want with creating different family types all right, and then you have individual elements. So when you place a single instance, you place a single element. And there are actually three kinds of elements. So we have model elements, datum elements, and view-specific elements. So let's take a closer look at those. First off, we have model elements. So these represent the actual 3D geometry of the building. And so we have walls, windows, doors, beams, columns, ducts, pipes, lighting fixtures. Those are all model elements. And so once again, if you think back to our hierarchy, we, we're working our way down here. And so we're, I know we're th throwing out examples before with system families and loadable families. And so now we're just with individual elements. So these can be instances of system families or loadable families. But the point here is that Model elements are those that represent the actual 3D geometry of the building. Then we have datum elements, and these are elements that help define the framework of a building model. So the examples here are levels, grids, reference planes, and so those help us to define the context, if you will. And so level one is at zero, level two is at 15 feet, level so on and so forth, right? And so that kind of helps build out the framework of your building model. Then we have view-specific elements. And these are elements that display only in the views in which they were placed. And so there's actually two kinds of annotation elements. So I know we have a lot of breakdown here. But there are annotation elements, such as tags, text notes, and dimensions. And those are used to annotate a drawing, essentially. And so you think about if you have a model and you have a floor plan view and you want to place tags and notes and dimensions, when you go to a 3D view, you don't want those tags and dimensions floating around in the 3D view. You typically want to place them in the, a, a 2D view and which is going to be used to document that building project. And you don't want them just floating around in the model. So that's where the difference between a model element, which is actually making up the 3D model. So if you go to a 2D view or a 3D view, you're going to see it. Whereas view-specific elements are only going to be in that view in which they are placed. All right, so annotation elements like tags, text, dimensions. Those are used to annotate a drawing. And then we also have detail elements. And these are things like filled regions and detail lines. And so when you are creating a detail, you can use detail elements to help complete that detail. And so once again, these are things that you don't necessarily just want floating around in the 3D model. 
they're going to be a view specific element to help create a detail. All right, now I want to wrap up talking about parameters or properties. And so we have type properties and instance properties. And so parameters, properties that can that can pretty much be used interchangeably in Revit. Now, type properties, those are common to all elements of a family type. So think back to our, our breakdown. We had categories, families, types, and instances. So when you create a family and you create a type, you can create type properties. And the type property, when you update that parameter, it will update for all instances all, so all element instances of that family type. That's so what you do is you click edit type to open the type properties dialog, and then you can adjust a type property, and it will update for all instances belonging to that, those family types, or that, that family type. So if you have 200 instances of a certain type and you update a type property, it will update for all 200 instances. Instance properties, on the other hand, they only apply to a single element instance. So back to the example, if there's 200 instances and you, you select one and you update an instance property, it's only going to update for that single instance. And the instance properties are found in the properties palette. So that was a lot. I know that's a lot, but Take a look at this video again and, and understand this terminology because it is critical that Revit users understand this hierarchy and organizational structure when working in Revit. Howdy! Thanks for watching. If you'd like more free content from Click to BIM, please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We also have affordable subscription options at clicktobim.com where you can access all of our videos. We also have an amazing search feature that allows you to search through every single word in all of our videos to help you quickly find the answers to your questions.